The Cavalcade of America. a fine comment received by DuPont, sponsor of the Cavalcade of America from a high school teacher in Michigan. The Cavalcade of America has caught the true local color of realistic, dynamic American history. The accuracy and vigorous spirit of the broadcast is to be commended. The hour chosen is most appropriate for the students in our schools, and my youngsters await the coming broadcast with intense expectation and enthusiasm. And I wish to express my sincere appreciation to your company. There is nothing so inspiring as voluntary praise of this sort. And it encourages every single person connected with the production of this program. Since the Cavalcade of America is also a tribute to the work of chemists, our listeners may learn something of interest and value from the brief stories of chemical research presented at the close of each broadcast, thus gaining a broader understanding of the DuPont Chemist Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra opens the program with a special arrangement of a Venetian love song by the American composer Ethelbert Nevin.
greatly have simple human qualities help make the America we know today, and particularly the quality of perseverance. Countless stories might be told of the part this quality has played in our country's growth. And for one of them, let us turn back to New England in the year 1841. We are in the kitchen in the home of the young mill hand, Elias Howe. Across the table from him, in the light of the whale oil lamp, his wife is sewing. Land sakes, Elias. You make me nervous, staring at me so. What's got into you? Huh? Oh, uh, don't mind me. I was just trying to find out how you sewed. Do you know yet? Well, I swear I could make my fingers fly, as yours do, but I think I've got the hang of it. Like to try? There's enough sewing to be done, goodness knows, with all the children's things. Yeah. And every stitch has to be sewn by hand, doesn't it? Well, if you know of any faster way, dear, I wish you'd tell me. Well, that's just the point. There isn't any faster way... Harry Davis was right by Jiminy. The man who could invent a machine that would sew would make a fortune and relieve this world of untold drudgery. Elias, what are you talking about? A machine to sew? Well, <laughs> where'd you ever come by such a foolish notion? No, no, it's not a foolish notion. Can't you see what it would mean? I can see what it would mean, but I can't see how it could be done. Well, that's what I have to find out, my dear. Elias... You're not serious. I most certainly am serious. And why not? I'm one of the best machinists in this town. Uh, I have a head, haven't I? Well, I, I'm going to use it. <laughs> yes, and make heaps and heaps of money for you. But, Elias, you... <laughs> no buts, my angel. I'm serious. There should be a fortune in it. And a new life for women. And I'm going to stick at it until I succeed. Now, uh... Show me how you sew. For a year, Elias Howe worked steadily to build a machine that would draw a needle back and forth. We find him in the kitchen with his wife and his father. I admire your perseverance, son, but I am beginning to have doubts about your intelligence. Now, don't say that, Papa Howe. Elias has been working dreadfully hard on his invention. You don't understand, Father. I understand what everyone's been saying about you, son. That you're a fine hand with tools if you'd only... If I'd only give up my one chance to amount to something, to make a name for myself, to provide a future for my wife and children. I know what they're saying. But if it's a fair question, son... What have you accomplished in the past year? Well, that's what I've been trying to explain to you, Father. I got off on the wrong track. I've wasted a year trying to build a machine that would duplicate the movements of the human hand. But now I have the right idea. You have? Dear, give me your sewing. Yeah. Now watch, Father. Hmm. I put the needle through and bring it up again. You see that loop of thread? Yes. Well, suppose another thread went through the loop and locked the stitch... So it couldn't come out. Why? Why, you'd have it, son. Yes, and that's the principle I'm going to work on. On top of the cloth, a needle going up and down. Below, a shuttle going back and forth. Now, doesn't that sound sensible? Of course, it takes take time to work out, Father. I have to be at the shop ten hours every day. There are materials to buy. Now, how much does Airy Davis pay you, son? Nine dollars a week. Why, that's ridiculous. What's ridiculous? Uh, Elias working ten hours a day, six days every week for nine dollars when he has this thing in his head. This, uh, this invention that the whole world is waiting for. Nonsense, that's what it is. It may be, Father, but I don't know what can be done about it. No, you don't, eh? Well, I do. You can tell Davis you're through. What, Papa, how? Yes, through. And you're going to pack up here and come and live with me, where you can use your brains to some effect. <laughs> Backed by his father, Elias Howe devoted all his time to build a machine according to his new idea. Three years passed. It is 1845. In a large Boston factory, we find the manager addressing an interested crowd. All right, silence, gentlemen, if you please. Silence. We're going to start the contest in a moment. 
Now, as you all know, Mr. Elias Howell, standing on my right, <laughs> has challenged five of the best journeyman tailors in New England. On my left, yes. yeah. Yeah. All right, quiet, yeah, quiet, quiet, please. Our friend Howell has challenged these boys to a race. He claims he can beat them sewing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now the, the boys are going to sew by hand. And Mr. Howell's going to use this, uh, this contraption on the table here. A sewing machine, I think he calls it. <laughs> <laughs> and each one has exactly the same amount of cloth measured most exactly by your truly. All right, boys, ready? All ready, Mr. Howell? I'm ready, thanks. All right, on your marks then. Get set and go. Take your time, boys. We don't hurry. We don't want to skunk him completely. <laughs> <laughs> As the race continues, the crowd watches breathlessly. Standing close beside Elias Howe is his friend, George Fisher, who has helped in financing the invention. The contest draws to a close. Come on, boys, get a wiggle on. Yeah, look out, he's gaining. Machine working all right, Eli? Yeah, uh, perfectly, George. Don't rush it, you've got lots of time. Yeah. All right, that old crowd, please. Give the contestants lots of room. Only another foot to go, Eli. That's the way, Eli. That's the way. This will convince them. There. There, it's finished, George. Good. Sorry, gentlemen. I'm afraid I've beaten you. All right, lad. What do you want? They have finished. Here, let's have a look. Oh, my partner's won, sir. There's no question about that. Well, take a look at the stitch. Yeah, see if it holds. Give it to Paul. Give it to Paul. Yep. Looks like he's won, boys, fair and square. Well, and a thing wrong. But I wouldn't have believed it myself if I hadn't have seen it with my own eyes. But no manufacturer was found who was willing to buy a machine which was believed to be still in the experimental stage. Yet Howe refused to be discouraged. If America was not interested, there were other countries. So 18 months later, we find him in the office of an English textile factory. Now look to here, Mr. Howe. Seems to me the firm's done all for you that can be reasonably expected. I can't agree, Mr. Thomas. I feel that I've been treated most shamefully. Aye. In what way, may I ask? When you brought me over from America, you agreed now, that... Now, come, come, lad. Let's stick to the facts. All we agreed to do, we've done. Pay you three pound a week for services. What about the money for royalties you owe me? Money for royalties? What's all this, lad? You know you agreed to pay me ten pounds for every machine you manufactured. Oh, we did. And have you a written agreement to that effect? You know there was no written agreement. Then you'd best say no more about it, Mr. Howell. Then you're determined to swindle me out of Easy, my... Easy, lad. We'll have none of that language here. Very well. What do you intend to do? Intend to do? Why not a thing except... Well, I'll make you an offer. You want to return to America. My wife is ill. Probably dying. Aye. Well, then, forget about this patent business and those royalties, and we'll see you have a passage home on the fastest black ball packet. No. How is that? A passage home... For all my work? Why, I'll see you hanged first. I'll work my way back to steerage. By selling his last model and pawning his patent rights, Howe raised enough money to return to America. Mrs. Howe never recovered. But true to his promise to her, Elias kept up the struggle. Soon after her death, his invention was recognized but other sewing machines were being made which used the principles covered by Howe's patent. Three years later, we find him with his father and George Fisher in the lobby of a hotel in Washington. How do you feel, son? Kind of anxious? No, no, father. I feel that the Supreme Court's going to decide the case in our favor. I really think we're going to win. If the Supreme Court knew what I know, Eli, you would win in the case and receive a laurel wreath to boot. How you stuck it out. What you've been through. The time your father's house burned down. The night I found you were driving a locomotive to get more money for materials. Yes. Yes, but the English experience was the worst one, George. 
And then, coming home to find my wife dying. My patent stolen over here as well. Oh, Mr. Elias Howe. Oh, well, there's someone calling me. Over here, my friend. Mr. Howe, congratulations, sir. A thousand congratulations. Oh, what happened? The Supreme Court has just handed down their decision before recessing for the weekend. But what was it, man? Hurry. Mr. Howe, you won on every count. Counts all those pirates to a fairly well. Oh, good. What's more, sir? Water. The payment of royalties has been made retroactive. You're a rich man, Mr. Howe. Do you realize it? A rich man right this very minute. You've won, boy. It's been a long struggle, but you've won. Many people have ideas, good ones too. But they don't have the courage to hang on to success. No, I'm proud of you, boy. Proud of you. Perseverance, unswerving faith in an ideal, the dogged courage to go on in the face of repeated disappointment. These qualities brought Elias Howe success and one of the most useful of all inventions to this country and the world. Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, moves on. Courage and perseverance marching shoulder to shoulder with American ingenuity. For centuries, men had talked of flying. Dreamers, inventors, daring souls had given their lives to the hopeless conquest of the air. And then in the year 1896 began the curious series of events that started a more persistent, tenacious struggle toward the unaccomplished goal. On an afternoon of this year, we find Wilbur Wright entering the family home in Dayton, Ohio, where he is greeted by his sister, Catherine, whom he had nicknamed Sturgeon. Hello, Sturgeon. How's all? Much better. Doctor been here? Uh-huh. He says the typhoid's practically over. All we have to do now is keep him quiet. We'll see to that, Sturgeon. Can I go in? Of course you can. Oh, Orv. Here's Wilbur back. Well, come in, Will. Hello, Orv. Here, you're better. <laughs> so they tell me. Be down in the shop almost any day now. Sit down. You come to the shop when you're told, young fella. Not a minute sooner. <laughs> Any excitement at the shop today? No. No, oh, there's an item in the afternoon paper that kind of interests me. Did you ever hear of a fella named Lillian Thaw? Otto Lineal Thaw? Well, what about him, Will? He was that German who's been experimenting with glider flight. Oh, yes, I know. He was killed yesterday. Oh, hard luck. Yes. Fell out of control while making his last flight before installing power. Well, I'm sorry to learn that, Will. Lillian Thor made some very important experiments. I think he had the right idea. You think he... Now, how much do you know about flying, Orv? Oh, quite a little. I've been following all these experiments, reading everything I could get my hands on. Why? Oh, it's funny. So have I. I've been hipped on flying ever since Dad gave us that helicopter when we were kids. You remember it? <laughs> sure I do. Do you remember those kites we made? I thought you'd forgotten those days, Will. Not by a jugful. Why, I'd give anything. Anything, Orv. Take up where this poor chap Lillian's all left off. You mean, take up flying seriously? Yes. First, find out all there is in books about the subject. You know, Chanute, Maxim, Langley. And then experiment. Build models. Tackle the thing scientifically. Sure. And keep at it until we get somewhere. Until we fly, Orv. Wilbur, you've been in there long enough. They're coming, Sturgeon. Long enough to start something, eh, hey, Orv? Three years later, on the banks above the Miami River in Ohio, the two Wright brothers flying a huge box kite. About them, a handful of eager youngsters... And a few skeptical adults. Oh, I'm ready to fly up, Mr. Wright. I can roll a string. Oh, I'm saying, Mr. Wilbur, you promise. I know, but later. This is serious business, son. You hear that? <laughs> serious business. Yeah, like your grandmother's foot. Why, they've been playing with them kites for two years now. Yeah. Just like a pair of kids. Tossing feathers in the air, watching birds. I think they're loony. Yes, I wouldn't be a mite surprised. <laughs> Hello. Looks like they thought they had something. Hey, what is it, Mr. Wright? What are you carrying on like that for? You're right, Orf. 
Gee, Willikins, look at that kite sail. Wilbur, I think we've got something at last. <laughs> Testing models, observing birds in flight, carefully studying air currents by means of floating feathers, the two men reach the point in 1900 where they think they can build a glider. And then at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina that year, the Wright brothers began the first of their 1100 glider flights. For three years they experimented, tested, changed their models, and finally, one day in October 1902, Wilbur runs panting across the sands after a 60-second flight the longest in a heavier-than-air machine on record. Orb! Orb, it works! It works! Sure does. What does it do, Will? Acted perfectly. The new wing's the answer, Orb. We've got it at last. It seemed to work pretty slick that time, Mr. Wright. Oh, simple as could be. When the wing tilts down, you just push the rod and back she comes. No side slip? No. We've definitely got lateral balance, Orb. You can keep it level. Go on, try it. It's marvelous. Sure, I'll try it. But remember, when the wings get even, level, I mean, don't forget to stop pushing that rod. Don't worry. All right, climb aboard. Come on, you men. Good. All hands on the rope now. Are you ready, Oz? Feet on the rod. All set, Will. All right, boys. Everybody pull together. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Give it a good one. Come on. Now. Don't forget the rod, Oz. <laughs> Long months of hard work follow. Another problem tackled with quiet, grim persistence. A problem that had never been solved before. The design and construction of a motor light enough and strong enough to lift their glider from the ground. Finally, on the morning of December 17, 1903, a handful of shivering men are gathered on the sands of Kitty Hawk. The Wright brothers and their helpers, five inhabitants of the nearby village, one lone newspaper man. It is shortly after 10 o'clock. How are you betting, Jeb? Figure they'll call it off? I wouldn't mind much if they did. This wind cut sharp on a knife. Mm. I wonder what they're aiming to do, Jeb. Put a machine up there on the track? And they got fixed there? Yeah, reckon that's the ticket, Moke. Of course, it can't fly. Any fool know that. Yeah, here's them right brothers now. How oh, all? I'll do it, right. Boys. Well, do. what do you say, Will? The wind's steady in. Yes, sir. I've been watching it. Should we give her a try? Yes. Let's get underway. All right, fellas. Lend a hand here. Oh, sure, Mr. Right, Rod. What do you have? Here. Well, we're going to turn the machine around. So it's a head and downhill, Mr. Rod? Yes, that's right. Uh, push on the wing, you two. Right. You other three each take hold of a strut and pull. All, right. Ooh, All together yeah, now. There you can't hold. That's right. Yeah, careful of the monorail. Don't let the landing skids bump it. Uh, appears to be that little pieces of bamboo won't stand much trifling. <laughs> that's enough. Now, everyone, please come in close. Now, grab hold of the landing skids and lift. Oh, the, the whole side. machine only weighs 650 pounds, so I reckon the seven of us can lift it easily, huh? Yeah. Come on. Are you all ready? I reckon I could lift it most myself. <laughs> all together, boys. All right. Uh, yeah. Easy now. Let her down on the tracks gently. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You ready, Orb? Why, it's your turn. You won the toss, Will. No, I had my chance the other day. Darn near wrecked the machine. Come on, climb aboard. You won't change your mind, Will? No. Maybe your chance to make history. Yeah, maybe his chance to commit suicide. Well, all right. Start the propellers, Will. Benzene on. Benzene on. Switch all right. Got the switch on, too. Give it a crank. Here goes, then. Let it warm up a bit, Orb. That's right. This right down from the North North Virginia pilot. Would you like to give me a statement before you go? I better wait till I come back. Yes, sir. All right, Will. Now, when I give the signal... Go off the holding wire and run beside the right wing tip. Right. Try to keep it level with the track. Or oh, that wind's increasing. Yes, I better go. All right, Will. Good luck, Or. Oh, no, ain't it? I never get it off the ground at that speed. She's picking up. Holy crap, look, she's lifted. It's in the air. Look, it's climbing. It Stick to it, Or. Stick to it. It's right, right, right. Right. It's right. Right. Thanks to the indomitable perseverance of two Americans, 
man had at last lifted himself off the ground, had finally conquered the realm of the bird. After centuries of hope and endeavor, the impossible had been attained, thanks to these same inherent qualities of character that are always found in the cavalcade of America. America has been fortunate indeed to have had citizens in every generation inspired by the spark of inventive genius. Their perseverance has created greater comforts and wider opportunities for every individual in the land. Last week I had an experience which led me to discover some of the little known ways in which chemical research contributes to our daily lives. It all started when I found a large ugly spot on my suit. A telephone call brought the dry cleaners to my door. And in a couple of days, I had my suit back spick and span. That same day, I was expressing my admiration of the job dry cleaners do when a friend of mine, who happens to be a DuPont chemist, told me a lot of interesting facts about solvents, chemicals that serve us by reason of their dissolving power. I learned that DuPont supplies a great many dry cleaners with the very solvent that does such remarkable work. It's also put up in handy cans for household use and sold in retail stores under the trademark TriClean. TriClean is only one of a large number of solvents that chemists have developed for various purposes. Many metal objects, for instance, must be cleaned to prepare them for electroplating, lacquering, or painting. If this cleaning had to be done by hand, the cost of many articles that you use every day would be much higher. Instead, they're given a bath in vats of the proper solvent and they come out clean as a whistle, ready for the finishing operation. Whenever you wear nice, fluffy, warm woolen clothing, you can thank chemistry because solvents were used to clean the raw wool. The paint, varnish, and lacquer industry uses great quantities also, for it is the solvent in these finishes that makes it possible to apply them. And if you've ever refinished an old piece of furniture, you probably used a solvent to remove the paint or varnish. Vegetable oils are sometimes extracted with solvents, lubricating oils refined with them, and rubber cement made with them. The task of producing just the right solvent for any particular job represents an inconspicuous but nonetheless important service that DuPont chemists perform for a number of American industries and indirectly for all of us. This is simply another expression of the DuPont ideal, better things, for better living through chemistry. They also serve. Stories of the fortitude and bravery of American womanhood will be heard next week at this same time when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York.